The mammalian diving reflex or the mammalian diving response is a very interesting reflex. In previous weeks we've been looking at brainstem reflexes that manage uh, aspects of the cardiovascular system. So now when we look at the mammalian diving reflex, it'll be easy for us because we, we're adding bits together basically. What is the mammalian diving reflex? Well, when you put your face in water, particularly cold water, you stop breathing, your heart rate goes down, and peripheral vasoconstriction limits the amount of blood going to your extremities and sends it to your core. This seems to be a method of reducing the amount of energy, the reducing the amount of oxygen that the body uses while you're in an environment where you don't have access to oxygen. You're under the water, you can't breathe. It seems to be a particularly powerful and rapid reflex. It's probably present in all mammals, maybe in all vertebrates. If that's all you needed to know about the mammalian reflex, mammalian diving reflex, ticked, you're done. But if you'd like to know more, we're going to look at the anatomy. We'll look at the sensory receptors, the sensory nerves responsible where they go. We'll look at the brainstem, the nuclei in there that are involved, and then the motor outputs that are affected, and join all this up and see how maybe this could be useful to us. So you put your face in cold water and the body responds to that. So it's the face that we're thinking about. And this is general sensation, right? Sensation of water, uh, pressure, temperature. And the nose is part of the airway, whereas the mouth is part of the gastrointestinal tract. And most animals seem to be most sensitive to the diving reflex um, at the nose. There seem to be nerves in the nasal cavity that are sensory, they're the sensory part of this. So the major sensory nerve of the face is the trigeminal nerve, so cranial nerve five. And the trigeminal nerve has uh, three major branches, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. So we're interested in these two branches, uh, V1 and V2. So the ophthalmic branch and the maxillary branch, both of those send fibers to the nose, but there's the nasal cavity there. Um, probably the anterior ethmoidal nerves are sensory from the most appropriate area for this reflex. Here's big head. So the anterior ethmoidal nerve of the nasal cavity makes its way to the orbit, is a branch of the nasociliary nerve, which is a branch of the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, which passes through the superior orbital fissure to get into the cranial cavity. And that's what we're seeing here. So there is the trigeminal nerve. Those are the three branches. That's the ophthalmic nerve there. And what we're seeing there is the trigeminal ganglion. So sensory neurons have this pattern where they have a ganglion, they have a, their nerve cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. And they send an axon back into the central nervous system and an axon, axon off, to, off to the sensory apparatus. So we're talking about general somatic afferents, so general somatic sensation, traveling with the ophthalmic nerve back to the trigeminal nerve, which is gonna go back into the brain in the pons in the brainstem. So the trigeminal nerve will enter the pons there's the medulla oblongata, there's the pons, the midbrain's up there. Um, we can always spot the trigeminal nerve because it's a big nerve. The, we have a lot of detailed sensation from the face. Um, a lot of detailed sensation means lots of neurons, lots of neurons means a big nerve. So it's this big nerve here. That's cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve. So these sensory fibers enter the brainstem in the pons and they run to the spinal trigeminal nucleus or the spinal trigeminal tract. This is where m most of the somatic afferents, most of the general sensation of the face enters the brainstem in there. And it's called the spinal trigeminal nucleus because it extends through the pons, through the medulla and into the spinal cord. So it's a long tract. There's a long collection of nuclei, a long collection of groups of nerve cell bodies all interconnected. So that's the sensory input, the spinal trigeminal nucleus. Now, inside here, what does that output do to cause the reflex?
We can work this out because we've got three things to do. Stop breathing, reduce heart rate, cause peripheral vasoconstriction. So to stop breathing, in the medulla, um, there are dorsal respiratory groups of nuclei and a ventral respiratory group of nuclei which are involved in driving the somatic muscles of respiration, the diaphragm, the intercostal muscles, muscles of the abdominal wall and so on. And fibres that come in from the nose that are implicated in the mammalian diving response link to the ventral respiratory group and probably to something called the pre-Butzinger center. And the neurons here have been implicated in uh, driving the rhythm of inspiration. So, sensory neurons go in and there's a reflexive link. There are links to the ventral respiratory group, neurons in the pre-Butzinger complex, which stop that inspiratory rhythm. Stopping breathing doesn't sound like a reflex response, right? But breathing is a reflex. There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of control. So part of the reflex is inhibiting that and stopping inspiration. In terms of this reflex, other things happen when you fall in cold water, but they're for another day. So that's the first one, ventral respiratory group. Number two, how would you slow the heart rate? Okay, so sympathetic innovation, increases the heart rate, parasympathetic innovation decreases the heart rate. The nucleus ambiguous is the nucleus supplying parasympathetic motor neurons that are gonna to run to the heart. So there is a relay between those sensory inputs and the nucleus ambiguous. And those parasympathetic motor neurons are gonna run out with the vagus nerve. So that's number two. So parasympathetic innovation then will slow the heart rate. Number three, in the rostral ventrolateral medulla, we find neurons that are the sympathetic outflow. So sympathetic neurons are gonna drive peripheral vasoconstriction and specifically peripheral vasoconstriction. They're not switching on sympathetic activity throughout the body. No, it's very targeted. Those arteries that are supplying the peripheries of the body, the sympathetic outflow is gonna cause the smooth muscle in their walls to constrict because, now we looked at this when we looked at the baroreceptor reflex and the, the chemoreceptor reflex, um, if the parasympathetic innovation of the heart is causing the heart to reduce its rate of contraction, then cardiac output is decreasing. But you need to maintain the arterial blood pressure to maintain flow to the brain. So as the cardiac output goes down, peripheral vasoconstriction needs to increase to maintain blood pressure so that blood still gets pumped into the cranial cavity and up to the brain and to the areas of the body that need it, right? So heart rate goes down, peripheral vasoconstriction is required to maintain functional arterial blood pressure. So the rostral ventrolateral medulla sends sympathetic outflow specifically to those blood vessels. Okay. So what are all the nerves responsible for that then? We've looked at the sensory nerves, we've looked at the brainstem reflexes. What about the motor nerves? Well, um, let's take the vagus nerve first. So the vagus nerve is gonna run out of the brainstem, out of the medulla, uh, through the jugular foramen, down the neck with the internal jugular vein and the common carotid artery. And then it's gonna run down into the chest. Here we see it on one side running around the aorta and then it runs posterior to the heart. So it innervates the heart here at the cardiac plexus and then the vagus nerve will continue down into the abdomen with the esophagus. So that's the parasympathetic fibers being carried from the nucleus ambiguous in the brainstem with the vagus nerve getting dropped off at the sinoatrial node in the heart and um, stimulation of those nerves causes a decrease in heart rate. Um, the sympathetic nerves, so sympathetic neurons will run down the spinal cord and at thoracic levels in the lateral horn of the spinal cord, the sympathetic neurons will synapse with preganglionic sympathetic neurons which will run out to the sympathetic chain, the sympathetic ganglia 
in the posterior thoracic wall and so on. And then postganglionic sympathetic neurons will run off to the target structures and many of those neurons will run with the arteries that they're going to supply. They'll follow the blood supply. Now the other nerve, uh, well the nerves, so that's parasympathetic and sympathetic taken care of, but of course the movements of breathing are performed by somatic muscles, skeletal muscles, muscles you can choose to control, but reflexes in the brainstem take care of breathing for you most of the time. So in terms of the diaphragm, we have the phrenic nerve. Uh, so these come out of the, uh, the spinal cord at level C3, 4 and 5. Those spinal nerves come out and form the phrenic nerve, which runs down to the diaphragm. So uh, really output to that nerve is stopped, so the diaphragm stops moving. And then likewise, there are other spinal nerves like these intercostal nerves, which will run to the intercostal muscles and spinal nerves that will run to the muscles of the trunk, the abdominal muscles that we also use for breathing. You know, whereas the parasympathetic neurons are doing something and the sympathetic neurons are doing something, um, the somatic motor neurons that we use for breathing, which normally do something all the time, they've been stopped. So people are often interested in the mammalian diving reflex because of how you might make use of it. Sure, if you're a, you know, a free diver, an apnea diver, this sort of physiology is helpful, but this might be a method for reducing your heart rate if your heart rate is elevated for not a good reason or for no good reason. For example, clinically, this might be one of those vagal maneuvers that you use to try to manage the heart rate in somebody that's having an SVT, a supraventricular tachycardia. It might also be useful in managing panic attacks and anxiety, but this doesn't work all the time. It doesn't work for everybody. But in those situations where the heart rate is elevated, so basically the sympathetic innovation, the sympathetic drive to the heart is elevated, so your heart rate is high, by putting your face in cold water for a period of time, and it needs to be quite cold, but not too cold, you might be able to trigger the mammalian diving reflex and bring the heart rate back down again. Um, if you're a patient and thinking about doing this, you should really have a chat with your doctor beforehand because there can be a number of other effects. It depends on what else is going on with your physiology right now that it might cause problems. Um, it's also interesting because um, of, well, cold water drownings, cold shock drownings. If you think about what we've been talking about, if somebody falls into cold, deep water, it's dangerous for a number of reasons. If somebody has a pre-existing cardiovascular issue uh, and the reflex is causing um, a decrease in their heart rate, an increase in peripheral vasoconstriction, affecting blood pressure throughout the body, this can lead to a heart attack. It can bring on a heart attack. Um, also with that peripheral vasoconstriction, well, the muscles peripherally are getting less blood. They're probably gonna be getting colder, which means the strength will decrease and the endurance will decrease in those muscles, making swimming much harder than you might expect, which will lead to drowning. And of course, this is having an effect on breathing. So breathing feels out of control. There is also something called the gasp reflex, which is different to the diving reflex but it can be difficult to breathe with that cold shock, um, which can be a problem. Hypothermia usually actually takes, I mean, in British waters, about 30 minutes to set in, but it's all those other problems that increase the chances of death in, in, in cold water shock. It is another very interesting brainstem reflex, and hopefully if you've been watching the reflex videos, you're starting to see a pattern now. You're seeing many of the nuclei we were already talking about when we talked about the baroreceptor reflex and the chemoreceptor reflex. Those same groups of neurons are being used again in the same fashion. They're just being linked to a different input. So you can see how you've got inputs, links, outputs, and we have these autonomic reflexes. Really, really interesting. and explains a lot of what we see happening in the body when, when things like this happen. But the mammalian diving reflex. I hope that was interesting. See you next week.